Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I just want to say a quick thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, thank you to our members and to everyone who is able to contribute to this program and to support the NSLM. I'm Valerie Peacock. I'm the Clarice and Robert H. Smith educator, and I'll give you a few housekeeping details about Zoom. Um, so right now you're probably viewing everything in full screen. If you want to exit full screen to be able to see the chat, um, you can basically go up to the top toolbar. You'll see view options. Click that and you'll be able to exit full screen. You'll still be able to see the presentation and you'll also be able to use the chat. Throughout the program, please feel free to ask any questions. You can do that by putting the questions in the chat. I'll be monitoring that for you. Or you can take yourself off mute and ask them yourself either directly to Michelle or Erica. I'm going to be really quick. I'm very excited to be able to introduce our librarians today. We have Michelle Guzman. She's our George L. Orstrom Senior Head Librarian. And we have Erica Libhart, who's our Mars Technical Librarian. Hello. Both of them have been working extremely hard on this program, and we're really excited to be able to see it. They've been talking it up for a while. So again, if you have any questions, please feel free to take yourself off chat, off, your, off mute, ask yourself in the chat, um, and I'll be on the back end to help monitor that. And I'm going to turn everything over to Michelle and Erica. All right, thank you, Valerie, for the great introduction. So um, Erica is going to be doing the slides, and I'll be talking. So for a little weird, that's what's happening. So if we could go to the next, or if we could see the PowerPoint. Are you not seeing the? Oh, sorry, I'm not. So. Let's see. Let's see if it was oh, yeah, can everyone see the lunch with the librarians PowerPoint first? Great. Oh, I see it now. A lot of head nodding. Awesome. Okay. Okay. Thanks right for your patience, guys. Okay. Let me, let me, right before you start, Michelle, um, if everyone's mm -hmm. seeing themselves in a strip down the side of the screen, um, if you want at the top, there are um, options to minimize that so that you can see more of the cover art when we get into that. Or you can leave all of us up if you would like to see all of our lovely faces. Um, and Michelle, <laughs> take it away. You ready for the first slide? All right. Okay. So if you go to the next slide, please. This one? Yes. Uh -huh. So here's, um, yeah, thank you. So, you know, really quickly, I'm just going to go do an introduction, a really brief introduction about the history of American periodicals and magazines, specifically during this time period of the 1880s and the 1920s. And then after I do my brief, like really general overview, overview I'm going to hand it over to Erica. And this is when you will get to see the images and our discussion about like specific artists and illustrators who did specifically sporting magazines during this time period. So in this quotation, I really like this um, from an author in 1980. I'll just read it here. The golden age of illustration was a period of unprecedented excellence in book and magazine illustration. It developed from advances in technology, permitting accurate and inexpensive reproduction of art combined with voracious public demand for a new graphic art. So if you could go to the next slide, please. So more specifically during this time period, um, it was considered golden because you actually had really distinguished artists producing both high art and public art, which is pretty unique in this area. Because, you know, nowadays you have that division where, you know, illustrators are, you know, specifically for magazines, for periodicals, for blogs, and you have like the high art artists who do, you know, gallery art, museum art, etc. Or, you know, they have a patron and whatnot. But, you know, back then during the 1880s and 1920s in particular, after the Civil War, the same artists who painted for the elites also produced images for the middle class. And this was really actually different from what it was before. Because if you were an artist back in the day, you had a patron, you painted, you know, or you drew or something like that, or you, you sculpted something. But then it would be in a museum or it'd be at a gallery or it'd be at someone's house. And the only way that person or other people in audience could see it was by going to that gallery, the museum 
or that person's house. But through the periodicals, you know, the artists and illustrators were able to share their art to a wider audience. Um, which goes to my second point, you know, the magazines were an art gallery for the world. And so not only was were the audience able to see fine and high art, you know, new artists, up and coming artists could showcase their work to a wider audience and general public, which was very different. Instead of, you know, just getting feedback from your clients or from a curator, or an editor from a, you know, a very singular magazine, you know, they would actually receive feedback from the American public, you know, just on the sales, the purchases of the periodicals, the subscriptions and et cetera. And during this time, there was a huge mass appeal and commercial success coincided. Artists and illustrators, you know, realized they could actually, in addition to doing, you know, fine art and having their clients, they could also support themselves financially by illustrating for these periodicals and for producing advertisements. Um, one thing about advertisements is some of the artists wouldn't want to actually have their name signed with that advertisement, like for Ivory Soap is a good example. Um, they had a lot of ads during this period because they didn't want people to know, oh, I'm making, you know, I'm illustrating for a bar of soap, but I'm also doing this amazing, you know, illustration that's on, in view in New York City. Etc. Mm -hmm. So, but even before the Civil War, um, there was an effort by the American Art Union in particular to popularize, popularize illustration and to attract new talents to the field. And they had membership that was, you know, pretty low, even with the currency differences, like, you know, $5 a year to become a member, but it enabled them to broaden their audience and broaden the number of people who could see their work. So, um, next slide, please. So, um, as I said earlier, it totally American interests, you know, in sports rose, or sports in particular rose steadily throughout the post, you know, Civil War period. And this was in, it was like two things happening during this time. People stopped, you know, because of technological and economic advances, more people were beginning to work in offices. Not a lot of people were working in farms or there was like an increase in people moving to cities working in offices, but at the same time, people had more leisure time because more Americans actually were beginning to get Saturdays off. I think I read somewhere that around 80% of Americans had Saturdays off. So for the first time, you had this huge population that actually had leisure time. You know, what were you going to do with it? So at, what you could do with it was literally, you know, go out, go hunting, go swimming, go shopping, you know, participate in sports, but you could also buy magazines, read magazines, and read books. And to the right is this image of the rifle. And I put this image here because you can see the date, it's 1888. So it's very early on, you know, illustration was still really expensive, right? So it's a line drawing, it's black and white, you know, it's mostly text because it's very, very expensive, you know, to put color at this point into magazines for the general, you know, consumption of the public. So next slide, please. Great, okay. So, you know, focusing on sports and recreation um, in the review of reviews, this was published in 1996, you know, going on with, you know, the sport, the you know, the growth of sports and the interest in sports. I love this quotation. There is an open air movement, almost revolutionary in its degree. And what was happening here was people were literally going outside. So in addition to hunting, angling, you know, horse sports, people were also interested in, um, this is when ice skating actually really picked up as a sport, which I thought was really interesting. Um, other, you know, just gen generic outdoor activities. You see this gentleman over to the left, just looking at the view over there. And, you know, people really wanted to connect with nature. There was like this whole link of, you know, I am an office worker, I'm working, I now have leisure time. And for my leisure time, I should connect to nature. So that was what was happening there. And, you know, the people, the publishers, editors in New York City, they saw that there was a huge opportunity to take a advantage of this interest, but also to take advantage of the new emerging technologies that would make printing for a general public cheaper. So um, I have this figure over here. So a ma I forgot what the name of the magazine was, but earlier, before this period, there was this one magazine where 
to print the poems was $565 for a print run, but it was $16,000 for the illustrations. So, you know, obviously you cannot charge that to the consumer. That would be absolutely, absolutely ridiculous. Like it would just be a very fine art type of magazine. But then at this, so now you're moving on to a cheaper way of printing, but specifically it wasn't the words that was obviously expensive. It was literally getting the, the art in there, like any images. And so the new, there was a new technology that allowed images to be inserted into text. And we keep thinking, you know, now we are used to working in Word, right? In Microsoft Office, you cut and paste, put it in Word, your image shows up. And, but back then that was a huge ordeal. So next slide, please. Okay. okay. So I got the same quote there again. And to the left, I kind of, sorry, these are kind of bad pictures, but these are examples of what the advertisements look like in these um, newspapers. This is all outdoors magazine in 1913. So in addition for artists like showcasing their work and we actually have high, you know, fine art being, you know, printed and published and shared to the general audience. You also have the emergence of, you know, advertising campaigns at this point. So in order for the publication to earn money and for artists to earn money, but for vendors to actually sell their goods for a very targeted audience, like this is the first time where you have Oh, there is a magazine called All Outdoors. I could sell my wool sweater to them. Or there is a, you know, a shooting the rifle magazine. I could sell my gun to these people or my bullets. So, you know, you have like all this convergence of all these different, you know, facets of, you know, culture in terms of technology. People have leisure time. The cost of items is going down where, you know, it just really, you know, kind of grew the illustration, you know, industry. And it was really great, you know, because how else are you going to sell things but by drawing things and making it attractive for people. And it's specifically from 1885 and 1905, um, a lot of the magazines were designed chiefly for hunters and fishermen. And this was because there was this huge, like I mentioned earlier, this draw of the outdoors and people wanted to experience it. So even if you were living in the city though, you know, people felt like they were able to participate in it by buying these magazines, looking at the pictures of the mountain or the hill or the deer hunt. So, and at this point there were still, you know, later on it would diminish, but the country was still, you know, full of game, streams were full of fish. So next slide. Next slide. Uh, oh, nope. Hold on. So, oh, there you go. So, you know, here are two covers of All Outdoors. And, you know, you could actually, that's a little hidden, but read this magazine and make your va vacation. I think below it, it says like, you know, enjoyable. So a lot of these magazines were actually also very, they were instructions, you know, to people like, how do you, you know, build a canoe? How do you ride it? How do you hunt through snow? And, you know, so it like was very much a general audience and, you know, people really picked it up. And by this point, you could see this magazine to the left, it was 15 cents or they're both 15 cents. Ladies Home Journal, for example, was $3 for a whole entire year subscription. So magazines just became much more affordable. People enjoyed them. And at the same time, there was like this idea that reading these and exposing yourself to different ideas actually bettered the mind. So I have this quotation from George Washington, who said, um, periodical literature has done more for the American people than any other. And uh, he continues to say, I consider such easy vehicles of knowledge as more highly calculated than any other to preserve the liberty, stimulate the industry, and ameliorate the morals of enlightened and free people. So magazines were also a way of just, you know, at this point, you know, we still remember I mean, he's a little later, but Norman Rockwell, where like, you know, this is where the images of America come from, right? In terms of like, America was coming onto the world stage. We are making our presence known financially, economically, like, you know, dip diplomatically. And, you know, these images were so strong that they would be shared around the world. Like you could find them in Japan and people were like, this is what America means, the wilderness, the outdoorsmen and things like that. So, um, that is all I have. So I'm going to like pass it on to Erica. 
Okay, so I'm going to share some of the cover art from some of the magazines in our collection. Um, I'm actually starting with uh, more lavish type of magazines called Polo. Um, actually, the first three magazines I'm going to share with you guys, it's Polo, The Sportsman, and Spur. They're all um, oversized magazines. It's sort of a folio size magazine, um, just really lush photographs inside, um, usually artists on the front. Um, and they were targeting uh, sort of uh, wealthy sportsmen. So these businessmen that were also getting involved in sport um, was the, the main target. So Polo was in production from 1927 to 1939 and covered general horsemanship, horse show results, sailing, steeplechase, polo, fox hunting. Um, it had many illustrations from photographs, a lot of drawings here by Paul Brown, who's, this is who I'm highlighting on this magazine. Um, this particular sketch was done by him specifically for the magazine. Um, many of the other things that we're going to see were pieces that the artist had done and the magazine featured it, but weren't necessarily um, created for the magazine. Um, Paul Brown, many of you are probably familiar with him. Um, if you've ever been over here to the museum and library, you've probably seen his things. We have a very large collection. Uh, the library has um, books about him, by him, illustrated by him. We have a large archival collection and um, the museum has pieces in their collection as well. And there's even one on display right now. So if you come to see Thrill of the Chase, there's a Paul Brown uh, painting of a steeplechase horse um, in action. Um, he was a prolific artist that specialized in equine subjects. Um, as you can see here, um, these two images in particular, he was really well known for being able to capture the motion of the horse. Um, and they're just lovely images, um, so colorful, so detailed on the, the musculature of the horse. It's really interesting. Um, in addition to illustrating books and publishing his own books, uh, he did a lot of commercial work. So he's pretty famous for his Brooks Brothers ads uh, that he did for periodicals. Oh, let me see what else. Yeah, we even have, we have several calendars he designed for Brooks Brothers in our archive as well. So Do we? if anyone wants to ever look at this. Mm -hmm. yeah. So related to polo um, in the same vein is the sportsman. Um, and I'm going to highlight a couple artists that were on the sportsman's cover. So this is Guy Arnaud, um, quite the character. He, from 1927 to 1937, he designed no less than 50 covers for the sportsman. And they're very dramatic. I'm going to show you four. So here's the first two. Um, he's covering cycling and uh, skating here. Um, and the sportsman covered almost any sport you can think of. They have articles on pedestrianism, curling. I mean, just everything is in the sportsman. Um, Arnaud's color and bold colors and graphics, I, I just really love. They seem so much more modern than, um, you know, the 1920s and 30s to me. And his life was just as colorful as his artistic style. So he was an illustrator and a painter, but also a fashion designer. He created stage sets and costumes, magazine advertisements, menus, and also illustrations for children's books and patriotic posters. Um, let's see his next. If you guys want to stay longer on any of these images, just let me know. So I feel like I'm kind of racing through them. Um, here's two more from Arno: uh, horse racing on the left and cross country skiing on the right. Um, I don't know, I just really enjoy these. They remind me of the New Yorker somewhat. Mm -hmm. So let me see. Also on the sportsman. So our next one is a fine art. So Arnaud was mostly an illustrator. Um, but John Wharf is uh, one of the most accomplished and esteemed watercolorists of the first half of the 20th century. Um, so I'll put his up here. So he, we've got an angling and uh, a yachting or sailing uh, image here, watercolors. Um, Wharf was born in Massachusetts and was extensively educated in art. Um, and around 16 or 17, he traveled through France and Spain, Portugal and Morocco. 
And when he gets back from this trip, that's when he really starts to focus on his watercolor works. Uh, he had a first solo exhibition in Boston in 1924 where he actually sold 50 pieces, which wow. is pretty successful. Um, and he remained successful, popular, and prolific through the rest of his career. Um, sadly, the museum does not own a piece by Wharf yet, but I would love it if we got something along these lines. I just, the colors are nice and bold. It's really dramatic um, action. I don't know. I really feel like they pull you in quite a bit. Uh, let me see if I have anything else in here. And he was, uh, he didn't do as many covers as Arnaud did, but he did more than these two. Um, so he was also contributing um, in addition to doing his, his fine artwork, he was contributing to these um, publications for the people. Like Michelle said, um, it, it was a way for a lot of people to participate in his art as opposed to just going to a museum or being able to make it to a show. And also, I'll just add for the illustrators themselves, it was a way to actually, you know, grow their clientele. By, yeah, you know, showing, selling their items to magazines for cover work. So, hey, Erica, we have a question sent to us. Sure. So, what are, how did you pick these covers? I just was going through our collections and pulled ones that I liked. So, <laughs> like, if I go back to Arnaud here, I love these. Um, so, I could have shown you all 50 of his covers and been a happy camper. Um, they're just so colorful. <laughs> I love this this horse with the spots here that he's riding on the bike. Um, I don't know, they're just full of whimsy. I really enjoyed them. So mostly we just, I, I narrowed it down to a couple of titles. So I picked these really lavish magazines, the Sportsman Polo, and we're gonna see the Spur next um, because they have such beautiful covers. And then just went through and picked ones that I enjoy that I thought you guys might like to see. So the next person we have should be familiar to a lot of you as well. It's Wesley Dennis, John Wesley Dennis. Um, he is largely famous for his collaboration with Marguerite Henry on the Misty of Chincoteague books. Um, he did illustrate quite a few books for her, I think 15 or, six, 15 or 16 titles uh, with Henry, um, but he also illustrated over 80 other children's titles. Um, People around here will be familiar with him because in the 1940s, he settled just down the road from the NSLM in Warrington on a farm where he kept horses, ponies, dogs, ducks, and he had a pet crow named Charlie. <laughs> uh, this cover, The Sportsman, features a dog rather than a horse. Um, Wesley mostly focused on horses, uh, but the dog image here, I think, really captures, uh, he seems very regal and I, I don't know, it's a very Great Dane kind of image. Um, I really enjoyed this and I thought just because he's sort of a local that people might enjoy seeing that he did magazine work as well. All right, let me see who's next. Oh, Frank Benson. Um, Frank Benson is a super multi-talented artist. I mean, he starts out as a um, impressionist paintings and realistic portraits, those two sort of uh, veins and ends up um, exploring watercolor and etching. Let me just show you some of his. We have him on the Sportsman and then on the Spur. Um, you can see these two couldn't be more different. Um, on the left, I believe this is an etching. It might be a wash. I'm not sure. Uh, let me see what I want to say about Frank. We have quite a bit of work about him in the library collection and we have a few items in the permanent collection, including a new uh, acquisition that we just recently got that's on view um, in the museum. So if you wanna come over, that's a watercolor. Um, so he began his career painting portraits of distinguished families and murals for the Library of Congress. Uh, he also produced numerous oil, wash and watercolor paintings and etchings of waterfowl and landscapes. And he had a career as an instructor at the, and department head at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Um, apparently, originally his goal was as an artist was to become an ornithological illustrator. And he does do a lot of birds. Most of his etchings and washes are birds. <clears throat> Um, but when he, he got, so after he started with the paintings and the portraits and he moves into these washes, 
Um, and they end up being so commercially popular that he wasn't able to keep up with the demand. And then later uh, etching catches his interest and he starts it as an interesting pastime um, to help him relax and that sort of thing. And um, he just ends up really fascinated with it. And so he exhibits etchings of wildfowl and they also become just hugely popular. Um, let's see what else. So he's best known as one of the most popular etchers, this is a quote from the Boston Globe saying that Benson was the best known and most popular etcher in the world at the time. Um, to one of his daughters, he said about etching, the whole process from the bare plate to the finished print is full of fascinating possibilities and possible failures. Uh, and ultimately he's one of the best printmakers in the 20th century. And he gets some credit for um, making wildlife prints a distinct genre, their own, their own little thing. Uh, but he also did watercolors, as you see here on the right. And like I mentioned, we have uh, one in the collection now. Um, he did more than 500 in his lifetime. And interesting little factoid, um, Benson designed the second federal duck stamp in 1935, which is going to prove to be a theme here pretty soon. So this is Frank Benson, um, you know, very multifaceted talent. And the spur, like I said, is very similar to um, Polo and the Sportsman. Um, Polo and the Sportsman both eventually get uh, absorbed by something called country life. Um, the spur gets absorbed by art and deco, I think it is. Arts and decoration. And then the title becomes Arts and Decoration combined with the spur. Uh, but it lasts a little bit long. The spur makes it to 1942. Uh, the sportsman and um, Polo both make it to sort of the end of the 1930s, and that's about it before they get, you know, but I, I don't think the Economic Times supported such a lavish uh, magazine format. And we'll see what else we have after Spur, but let's see next. Okay. Oh, Roland Clark. I love these images. Um, we have some really <laughs> great books uh, with Roland Clark's work in it. Um, I don't know, they're so warm and it seems so realistic. Uh, let me see, we have some prints in the museum collection and like I said, lots of the library books. Um, he was an artist, an author and a sportsman. He's particularly well known for his etching of game birds such as ducks, geese, woodcock and quail. Um, he really enjoyed sailing, fishing and horseback riding but his greatest pleasure was hunting waterfowl in the marshes around Long Island Sound. So, and the end, he combined this love with uh, and made it into a job. Um, and he made hunting and sketching trips to Scotland, Canada, and all along the East Coast of the United States. Um, and he would use sketches that he made from life in the field and then create etchings from those. Um, and he was shown all around New York City. Um, like I said, published several books combining his etchings and paintings with stories about the trip. So what was happening when he came across the scene that he's showing you. So it was really an immersive kind of thing. It was a cool way to, to be there without being there. Um, and Roland Clark also did a federal duck stamp. He did 1938 duck stamp. So three years after Benson's duck stamp, Roland gets on the game. Hey, Erica, we had another question sent in, um, the duck stamp. Huh? What's a duck stamp? Uh, it's a program that the government, the post office runs every year. So, um, and I believe they're still doing it. Um, actually, Valerie and I have been talking about trying to get the contest to come to the NSLM at some point so we could see the submissions. But every year um, there are submissions for postal stamps, the art for postal stamps. Um, I don't really know that much about the history of it off the top of my head, uh, but that's basically what it is. So you could make a painting of your preferred duck. Um, they may give you a theme. I'm guessing there must be a theme uh, every year. And then they have a contest and select a winner and that's who gets, you know, that's where the art comes from that are on the postal stamps. And maybe we'll be able to get it to come here. What do you think, Valerie? Can we get that sometime? Working on it. It's a, <laughs> a long progress, but I will keep you all updated. <laughs> Well, it's hard when we're closed down for COVID. I mean, you kind of have to be able to come and see it in person, so. It is. <laughs> All right, so our next 
Spur person. This is Lynn Vogue Hunt. Um, we have some of his book illustrations in the library's collection as well as books about him. Uh, this image is deep sea fishing. Um, at age 21, Hunt worked as a staff artist at the Detroit Free Press. And in 1903, he moved to New York City where he was a freelance artist providing illustrations for magazines and advertisements. Uh, but he also illustrated books on waterfowl hunting, upland game hunting, and saltwater fishing, which we see here. Um, and these were also his main interests. So he did a lot of uh, work in the field. He would go out in the field participating in these sports, uh, much like Benson, and uh, come back and do these illustrations. Um, he contributed regularly to Field and Stream, which oddly the NSLM doesn't hold much in the way of Field and Stream, which is just a classic title in sporting magazines, but we might have line on a new donation on that. So we'll see, we might have some more for you guys to look at if you're interested. Um, he publishes a couple of books, Game Birds of America. Um, he also did a federal duck stamp the next year, the 1939 federal duck stamp is Lynn Bogue Hunts. Um, and then the editor of Field and Stream wrote about him there are very few artists indeed who can paint wildlife as a sportsman sees it in the field. Hunt can do this. Um, so his work, I mean, this isn't the best image in the world as far as I'm concerned for, for Hunt, but um, I like to have a little variety in the show. So we put in a deep sea fishing, uh, mm -hmm. but if you guys are interested, I would love to have you come in and take a look at some of the other uh, work that he's done because it's pretty amazing. And he is best known how old was he when he did this? Why can't I find this? All right, maybe I'm thinking of somebody else. I thought he illustrated a famous book, but it's not him. Okay, so Limbo Hunt. I think I have one more spur. Yeah. So this is Carl Rungius. Um, great picture of this guy. He's pretty interesting. Uh, he was born in Germany, but moved to the United States and spent his whole career painting in the Western United States and Canada. So he does all these big sky, big game uh, images. Um, he earned a reputation as the most important big game painter and was the first career wildlife artist in North America. Uh, he found work as uh, hunters and naturalists commissioned wildlife illustrations for their magazines and books and for their campaigns to protect endangered animals. Uh, his arrival in the United States coincided with the recognition of the plight of the continent's game animal and bird populations. Uh, several concerned sportsmen had turned their energy to correcting the deteriorating situation, the most noteworthy being Theodore Roosevelt. Um, Around 1909, he gave up illustrating to pursue a career as a full-time easel painter, but his illustrations stay in circulation long after he stopped making them, and they end up playing a large role in spreading information about ethical hunting. Uh, in the early 20th century North America, there were few major zoos, and photography was still in its infancy, so illustrations from books and periodicals were the public's main source of information concerning wildlife. Um, kind of circling back to Michelle's, you know, it, it makes it accessible for everybody. Not everybody can go to Montana and hunt, but we can all buy a copy of the spur for 50 cents and, and see the animals uh, the way that they are. Um, he was an avid sportsman and spent a lot of time in the wilderness more than most other artists. So he's painting from direct observation and gets some additional insight into the animals and how they interact with their environment. So most of his paintings include landscape and wildlife together in a single picture. Um, he puts the animals in their natural environment, behaving the way that they really do. Um, and this was fairly new to painting in the early 20th century in North America. Uh, his paintings are somewhat romanticized and you know they're showing like the world without any signs of human impact. So it's sort of an Eden-like uh, image. Uh, but his, his work is really dramatic. Um, I think it's interesting, the tie to um, conservation, you know, getting, getting the word out there. And that sort of leads me into our last two titles that we're going to talk about because they have a much more... Oh, one second. No, sorry. You want to Can I add something? 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. So Carl Rungius. So he was the illustrator for Theodore Roosevelt's favorite book, The Still Hunter. So he illustrated some of them, Carl Rungius and um, Van Dyke. They, they both illustrated scenes in The Still Hunter, which was Theodore Roosevelt's favorite book on hunting. And, you know, it ties into what Erica was saying about conservation, where, you know, they were trying to like, you know, still hunting about trying to not use a blind and actually hunt getting as close to the animal as you can without disturbing them. And, you know, so I thought it was really interesting, you know, just like Erica was saying, like nature, Eden, untouched. And mm -hmm. it was Theodore Roosevelt's favorite book. So, right. Thank you. Excellent. So the next two titles I'm going to talk about, Outdoor America and All Outdoors. I'm just going to change it now because um, this is Edward Lund and I included it because I love this image. I just, I really like this a lot. I could not find anything out about Edward Lund. So I will leave his image up while I'm just talking about Outdoor America in general. Um, outdoor America and All Outdoors both have more of a con conservation bent than the um, sort of luxury sporting magazines that the ones we already looked at do. Um, Outdoor America was 1922 to the present, still going. Uh, covers hunting, fishing, fish and animal conservation. Um, there's many noted contributions from writers um, and illustrations were from plain photographs and drawings. Um, you get a lot of covers in color like this, dramatic covers. Um, it's basically, it's the informational organ for the Isaac Walton League which is a national organization with over 220 local chapters that meet to discuss conservation and other outdoor topics. Um, so there's been a couple different titles throughout its existence, but um, like I said, 1922 to present, and it's mainly focused on conservation topics. So they're talking, um, you know, ethical hunting, ethical fishing, landscape preservation. Um, they would have been involved uh, when we started working on um, hunting seasons and regulating these things to protect the breeding seasons and to protect the migration routes and this sort of thing. So let me go. So this is Edward. Um, like I said, just really a dramatic angling image. Really like that one. Okay, William Schmedgen, Outdoor America. Um, we do have some of his illustrations in our book collection. So just like everybody else, most of these guys illustrated, you know, for many different venues. Um, love the mustache. I just have to put that in. <laughs> he studied at the Art Institute of Chicago and was a successful career uh, newspaper illustrator, first at the Chicago Mail and later at the Chicago Record, where he would become the head of the art department. Uh, he was also a field artist for the Chicago record during the Spanish-American War, stationed with U.S. troops in Cuba. Uh, eventually, he begins wildlife painting as a stress-relieving activity uh, and enjoys it so much that he spends more and more time uh, working on these sorts of projects, and eventually he develops a successful second career as a commercial wildlife artist. So his uh, artwork has graced the covers of popular outdoor magazines, such as this one here, um, advertising, calendars, posters, jigsaw puzzles, and even sheet music. Uh, he's mostly um, wildfowl like this, but in their natural area. Oldine Trip. Um, also, I love this. It's such an evocative, the, the full moon camping scene. It just, I don't know, you can just hear like the frogs croaking and the bugs. Uh, but I included this, even though I don't have a lot of information on this artist, because it's the only woman in our talk. Um, she did quite a few covers for Outdoor America, all of them lovely, but this is my favorite one. Um, she was married, had two kids, lived in Illinois, also illustrated some children's books. Uh, but that's really about all I found out about her in general. So, you know, there's a project there somewhere, I think, uh, early. She's not the only... Um, woman sporting artist at this time, but there's not a lot of them. And I really like this image. Okay, this is gonna be my last artist, Philip Goodwin for All Outdoors. Um, let me go back and tell you a little bit about All Outdoors. This one went from 1913 to 1922, so it, immediately preceded Outdoor America. Uh, published in New York, covered hunting, fishing, camping, outdoor life. Um, 
most of the later issues are have colors have covers in color. The earlier ones are black and white. <clears throat> um, it was announced it would become the official organ of the newly formed Outdoor League of America in 1921, which was an organization that invites the cooperation of all sportsmen who wish wildlife, game, scenery, and all natural resources perpetuated for the value and joy they furnish. Uh, this magazine merged into outing in 1922. So uh, tracing the lifespan of different magazines is also an interesting and challenging thing. Uh, we had a fellow here uh, several times, uh, Duke Biscotti working on bibliographies of American sporting periodicals and then British sporting peri periodicals. And it is challenging because they're constantly changing their titles slightly, being absorbed by other titles, combining and eliminating sections and changing their focuses. Um, but this one, uh, again, really focused on uh, preservation, I think, conservation and preservation of the natural world. They didn't want to see it go, and it was going. So back to Philip Goodwin. Um, again, we have books illustrated by him uh, and about him. He's an American painter and illustrator and specialized in depictions of wildlife, the outdoors, fishing, hunting, and the Old West. Uh, provided illustrations for numerous books and magazines, as well as for commercial items such as posters and advertisements. Uh, perhaps best known for illustrating Jack London's Call of the Wild, which he did at age 22, and for providing the cover art for many issues of Outdoor Recreation, Outdoor Life magazine during the 20s and 30s. Uh, he's also the artist who designed the horse and rider trademark of the Winchester Repeating Arms Company. In the middle of his career, uh, he started spending a lot more time out in the field out west and ended up becoming friends with Carl Rungius, who we talked about a couple slides ago. Um, so he learned some of the finer points of hunting and surviving in the wilderness. Uh, he also met and became friends with Roosevelt and Will Rogers. Uh, his calendars were published by Brown and Bigelow, the nation's largest calendar publisher, and he received substantial commissions for illustrating advertisements for Horton Manufacturing Company which made steel fishing rods. Uh, Winchester Repeating Arms Company and the Marlin Firearms Company. So he was very, fairly commercial, uh, but still was able to capture, you know, the emotion and the romance of the, the American West, which um, people were really fascinated by. So this is it for Philip Goodwin. Um, I would like to say that we could probably do several other programs all on advertising or just the other things in these magazines. They are fabulous to look through for the ads, for the fashion. Um, some of the Spurs and Polo magazines have great um, real estate ads where you could see floor plans for these apartments in New York City that they're selling for $4,000 on Central Park. Um, they're, they're just really, really interesting to spend some time looking through. And if you guys would like to come and see any of them, all you have to do is call and make an appointment. We'd be happy to let you sit down and page through some of these magazines uh, anytime. They're, they're really a gem. So I guess that's about and all we have. Emails in the chat as well. So I'll be putting the emails for Erica and Michelle in the chat. Um, but if you ever lose them, you can just call the museum and we're happy to help you out with that. The library is open by appointment, um, but we're taking appointments. So just feel free to call. Let us know you want to come look at some periodicals or anything else. We're happy to pull them out and you mm -hmm. can look. The museum is open Fridays and Saturdays, 11, 12, and 2. You just make those appointments online. Or if you have trouble, just call us. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to put your emails in the chat right now. All right, guys, does anyone have any questions or want me to go back through the slides at all to see any of the images? Any questions or comments? Thank you, can you very take much. Take yourself off of mute and you can just talk if you like. No, thank you for attending. This is our first Zoom as the librarian, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, guys, thank you so much for supporting. We really do appreciate it. And uh, they will come up with another interesting topic uh, soon, especially if COVID mm -hmm. keeps up. <laughs> yeah, any suggestions would, we are open to because you know it's really hard to show text right and via zoom or do a rare book tour so this program has also been recorded 
Um, so I'll be taking that and adding a little title in the front, and then we'll be putting it on a private link in, in um, YouTube, and then we'll send that out to you as well, and you'll be able to access this again. All right, guys, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>